once I went on this hike in 1989, I couldn't believe that I had lived here and not heard anything of it. And I used to haunt antique stores, flea markets every weekend. And Welcome to the SGV Master Key, a show where you will hear personal stories of triumph over failures and how others successfully navigated the unique landscape that is the San Gabriel Valley. What makes us different? Well, just like you, we have chosen the San Gabriel Valley for our home or businesses or both. We believe it is the people and small businesses that make this community great, and we love to share their stories with you. We always encourage your questions and feedback, and you can find all of our contact information at sgvmasterkey.com. Here are the hosts for the show, Russell Mono and Scott Warman. All right. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the SGB Master Key. Uh, we really appreciate you tuning in every week and spending this time with us. And uh, today we have uh, another guest related to things that we really enjoy, right? And that is hiking. So many guests have had a connection to that. Yeah. Well, what's really interesting is something you told me just before uh, the show that the San Gabriel Mountains, as I understand it, are the... Uh, quickest ascent of any uh, mountains in the world that's right yeah in my in my geography class in college that's what i learned and um it's it's sort of difficult to believe right but i guess when you when you're standing at the foothills and you look up they they are pretty steep yeah it is steep but i remember 10 or 15 years ago and and i lived here in pasadena for 27 years uh but it wasn't until maybe 10 or 15 years ago, someone told me about Mount Low and the, uh, you know, the hiking trail there and going up to Echo Mountain. And it was um, a real discovery for me. And, and it was so exciting because for me, it's like a perfect hike from Lake Avenue up to the uh, old site of a hotel and the you know, the railway remnants that are there. And the whole story is a very fascinating story. And it just became one of my favorite places to go. And I've gone there now, you know, very religiously for at least, I'd say probably 15 years. And, you know, it's just a perfect run up to uh, the top of the, uh, well, not the top of the mountain, but to the uh, site of the old hotel there. Right. Yeah. There, there's so much history, right. And anybody who goes up there, there's these signs that are kept and you can see, uh, where there used to be a uh, rail railway up there, right. Up right. on the mountain, which is fascinating. And it's hard yeah. to picture if, if those pictures, uh, didn't exist. Right. Well, yeah. And then the photos at, at the top, uh, you know, just really, and the little, you know, um, stories with the photos just just fascinating and we're so lucky to be able to talk to somebody today who uh, really knows that inside and out oh yes absolutely and that brings us to our guest today uh our guest is michael patris welcome to the show thank you so much for having me i appreciate it thank you so we, you are an expert in this <laughs> thank you for the kind words yeah so so tell us tell the listeners what is your connection with the san gabriel valley well, I'm a third generation native of Southern California. I grew up, went to school here, grew up at the beach actually, and didn't move to the San Gabriel Valley until 1985. But when I did, I started taking advantage of some of the local landmarks. And of course, the San Gabriel Mountains were one of them. Love to hike, you know, anything to do with outdoors and, and outdoor activity is something that I've always enjoyed and embraced. And it wasn't until about 1989 that uh, on an early date with my now wife, who almost has been married to me 30 years, uh, we went out with an LAPD motor sergeant who was recuperating from a drunk driving accident where a drunk driver had hit him while on duty. And uh, in those days, my mornings ended at 11 in the morning from work. And uh, he said, I'm going to start hiking in the local mountains and I'm going to go to some really amazing places. Would you like to go? Sure, why not? So the first uh, hike that we did was exactly as you've done, Scott. We went to the top of Lake Street, got out at the Cobb Estate, made our way to the Sam Merrill Trail, three miles up to Echo Mountain, 
And that was before there were some interpretive signs up there, but there was obviously the remains and foundations of railways, a water reservoir, some amazing, amazing things. And I had never heard of it. And he said, yeah, there used to be a railroad up here. And I said, there is no way on God's <laughs> green earth there was a railroad up here. But indeed there was. And uh, my grandmother was still alive at that time. She grew up in Long Beach and she said, yeah, we went there in 1933. We took the red car from the Pacific Electric Railway from Long Beach to 6th and Main in downtown Los Angeles. Went up to Echo Mountain, shared a sandwich and a Coke and came back home and it was a whole day's activity. And I couldn't believe that being a third generation native that nobody had ever spoken of this before. It was just amazing to me to find that there was this huge resort. There had been four hotels, an observatory, a zoo, a dance hall, world's largest searchlight, served three million passengers a year. I mean, amazing stuff and, and virtually little information at that time. At the time you first discovered it, uh, what were, were these informative signs there? Or is that something that maybe you put in later? So, uh, no, the signs were basically not there. Uh, the signs basically came about in 1993, which was the centennial anniversary of the opening of the railway. That was done in cooperation with the Forest Service and a couple of other groups that maintain trails and do things up in that area. And over time, uh, back to 2000, uh, we formed our nonprofit foundation and we wanted to aid in the restoration and the preservation of some of the things, not only that existed there, but other things throughout the community. So... I didn't introduce you with a title. What is your title, Michael? Well, that depends upon whom you ask. Okay. So I am the president and founder of the Mount Low Preservation Society, a nonprofit foundation since 2000, as I mentioned. I also am the president and owner of Golden West Books, a railroad publishing company started by Donald Duke in 1960. And uh, that is part of our nonprofit foundation as of 2010. So uh, we also have a museum building that we're renovating, 14,000 square feet in Pasadena. So I have multiple titles and multiple hats, and they all kind of surround around the nonprofit preservation of local history and uh, the education of what we have here in the San Gabriel Valley. So when you started going up uh, in the mid-90s, I think, up Mount Low, is that right? Or 1989 was the first. 1989. Yep, so And then it has continued ever since. So during that time period, um, how developed was it in terms of the trails? Is it something similar to what it is now? There have been ebbs and flows with that because as we have a lot of rain sometimes and other times not, uh, the vegetation and foliage kind of takes over the trails and then a lot of people that maintain trails, forest service, volunteers, people of that nature will chop those things back. We've had a couple of wildfires that have impacted that area over time. And then of course the centennial anniversary I mentioned in 1993 where everything was cleared back so people could really see what was there and there was a big advertising effort and push to make people aware of it and then invite them to come and see it. But as you mentioned, and as you know, because you've hiked there, it's three miles up and three miles down. It is rather steep, Russell, as you have mentioned, because of the topography. And it's not for the faint of heart. I mean, it's not a killer, but you know, you don't do it when you're five or when you're over 80 if you're not in good shape. Well, it's definitely one of Pasadena's treasures to me. And um, one of the questions I have um, is, who, who actually owns it? What, what is the whole history of that site? Because I know it's a very uh, fascinating history as well. Some of the owners have included the Marx Brothers, um, as I've been told. Is, is all of that A bit of an true? urban legend, but there, there is like uh, a milligram of truth okay. in that. Okay, <laughs> all right. So, so you're the expert. We're so uh, you know, lucky to have you here to clean up uh, you know, all these uh, inaccuracies. But what is the history of that, you know, that space? So basically, in order to tell this story, there are a few things that need to be known. So the man that came here, Thaddeus Sobieski Constantine Lowe, he was born in Randolph, New Hampshire in 1832. He retired to Southern California in 1888. He ended up building a 24,000 square foot home on South Orange Grove on the west side of the street, south of where Wrigley House or Tournament House is now, between Arlington and Orange Grove Circle. He owned 15 acres that went from Orange Grove all the way down to the Arroyo Seco. Uh, he had a four-story observatory built onto his house because he was an amateur astronomer. And he had retired here after building seven balloons for the Union Army to spy on the Confederates. So he was 
the first aircraft reconnaissance person that we've ever had. And most people don't equate that to the Civil War. They think about World War I and biplanes and things of that nature. So Thaddeus Lowe came to Southern California to retire. He had had successes with the Civil War Balloon Corps. He had done ascensions on the White House lawn with Abraham Lincoln, was an overnight guest there. And in those days, when you wanted to fill up your balloon for combat, you didn't pull over to the local gas station and say, fill her up. I mean, you had to figure out a way to make gas. And in those days, it was hydrogen gas. So he invented more than 200 patentable items, but among those was... Uh, the actual ability to produce hydrogen gas in the field. So hydrogen gas was not his first choice. He tried ammonia gas, he tried a lot of other things, and with those things were failures. With those failures, he moved to Southern California, and by the late 1860s, early 1870s, his patentable methods for producing gas for heating and illumination were used in two-thirds of homes in the United States at that time. So it's kind of a long way around the block to tell you this, but when he moved to Southern California and had the ability to build this 24,000 square foot home on 15 acres, he really had come here to retire and slow down. He had opened several gas companies here. He owned the Pasadena Ice Company at time. And the people in the area, including uh, Perry Green, who was the mayor of Pasadena at that time, they all had wanted to get up into the local mountains and be able to use this as an accessible area for tourists and homeowners alike. It was a great thing to get in the outdoors, get some fresh air. So the building of the railway, first and foremost, was not Thaddeus Lowe's idea. It was kind of the heads of... of industry and, and commerce here in Pasadena that began that. And their original thought was to build it to the peak of Mount Wilson. So when that first began, construction began in the 1890s, early 1890s, uh, they made their way up. They had done a survey with David Joseph McPherson, who was a formally trained Cornell graduate civil engineer. He had worked for the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway in Texas. He became a new resident of Pasadena as well. And when they started surveying this area, there was an argument going on on the peak of Mount Wilson because there were two camps there. There was Strain's camp and Steele's camp. So these two gentlemen couldn't agree on where the terminus of the railway would be because it would advantageously affect one or the other if it ended closer to one camp or the other. So over time, they said, you know what, you guys are arguing you're never going to get over this. We're just going to build to another place. So they ended up changing their direction. They had already gotten into Rubio Canyon at that point, and they ended up building to Oak Mountain. Andrew McNally of the Rand McNally Map Company said, well, Thaddeus Lowe, you've done so much for the community. We're going to rename Oak Mountain in your honor, Mount Lowe. So the construction began in the 1890s. It was open July 4th, 1893, and that property, once he was building into it, was one of the first national forests that there were. But word was very slow to come from Washington, D.C. to Southern California. So basically, the government said, hey, Mr. Lowe, you're building on private property. We're going to allow you to exist until the railway ceases operation, at which point in time we're going to take that land back. You are going to remove everything that you've put there or your successor companies, whomever, and it's never going to exist again. So I don't know if that specifically answers it, but there are modern questions about, well, why don't they rebuild it? Why don't they do something different with that property? Well, because it's federal property, uh, it's an attractive nuisance if you have things that are climbable, viewable, and so people want to make sure that people aren't going to hit, get hurt up there. You're an attorney, so you understand how litigious we've become over time. So that's how that was. But I can say that as early as 1951, a young man named Walt Disney was thinking about opening an amusement park. And he thought that it would be great to resurrect that incline that was nearly 3,000 feet in length, go up there and put rides to be able to ride up on Echo Mountain in the surround. So uh, it's, it's an amazing legacy because we know the success of Disneyland and Walt Disney. Too bad it didn't end up there. So I hope that answers the question about who does that property belong to and why will it never come back? Well, that that is a re <laughs> remarkable story. I mean, just a few of the names you dropped, you know, Rand McNally, McNally of Rand McNally, uh, Walt Disney. But it was federal land. Yes. It is federal land. Yes, Is correct. that right? Okay. Uh, what is the conservancy? And uh, w what does that uh, take in and what does that protect? So basically, there is an organization called the Foothills Conservancy. That's a nonprofit organization 
I know they exist. They've asked me for photographs. I've loaned things from our collection, but I don't know any of the specifics. I know that they have purchased some of the areas in and around Rubio Canyon. They want to preserve that bridge between developable private land versus federal land and make sure that there is more buffer in between both. Uh, so I know that they do some wonderful work, but I'm not involved with them specifically. Does the U.S. Forest Service have jurisdiction at that uh, at at Mount Low? Yes. Okay. So Mount Low, the actual peak, which is if you are familiar with the San Gabriel Mountains and you know where Mount Wilson is and the repeater antennas and transmission antennas, this is the next taller uh, peak to the left or to the west if you're looking north and facing that. So Mount Low is just above 6,000 feet and Mount Wilson is just above 6,000 feet also. There's been controversy as to what the actual measurements are, of course, and these days we have the ability to do those accurate measurements, but they were basically similar height peaks in those days. But it is under the jurisdiction of the Forest Service, as is Echo Mountain down below. And you mentioned earlier the Marx Brothers. So when you get to the top of Lake and you stop and park your car, there are cobblestone rocks and a wrought iron gate. That was called the Cobb Estate, C-O-B-B. -B. The Cobb family were uh, lumber mill people. They had had a very wonderful home in there. Over time, it burnt down. And the Marx brothers were thinking about sometime in the late 40s, early 50s, to buy some land and invest. And they wanted to have a Jewish cemetery. And over time, they figured out, well, maybe not just a Jewish cemetery, maybe just a cemetery. So they did look at that property because the Forest Service is adjoining, they couldn't get anybody to agree that that would be a good place. It's also a zone that's prone for flooding and wildfires and things of that nature. So it just, it, it lasted for a millisecond. They didn't make an offer. There was no contract. There was no acceptance. So it was never a deal, uh, but it was considered. Wow. Well, yeah, I don't think I would have ever found that information because I've read in multiple places that, that it was owned at some point by Marco uh, or Groucho Marx, I'm sorry. And uh, thank you for clearing that up. No problem. But uh, this is a, a lot of history on, on the area. And was it this first trip in 89 that, that sort of fueled this passion into what you do now? Or, or what started that? Well, I think it comes from a defective gene at birth. Uh, I have always been a collector. I mentioned to Scott and maybe to you, Russell, when we first ended up meeting and speaking that uh, I grew up across the street from the beach. And when I was a kid, I collected rocks and shells. And as I developed a budget, it became stamps and coins. And then when I got a driver's license, it became antique and classic cars. So I've always been a collector. I've always loved old things, whether they were fossilized from the whatever period, Mesozoic or whatever. And uh, once I went on this hike in 1989, I couldn't believe that I had lived here and not heard anything of it. And I used to haunt antique stores, flea markets, every weekend and when I first started dating my wife we both loved the same things and we would look for stuff for the Mount Low Railway once we finally got kind of focused on this thing that existed and then we knew that Henry Huntington bought it out in 1902 and incorporated it into the Pacific Electric Railway red cars that provided more accessibility by having 1,100 miles of track in four counties Los Angeles, Orange Riverside and San Bernardino so they were willing to take the loss for the mountain resort and incorporate it into what they do because obviously they were enormously successful. Henry Huntington dies in 1927. It becomes part of the Southern Pacific Railroad. It exists until 1936 when the fourth and final hotel burned to the ground and it was never rebuilt. So it wasn't that long thereafter that it ended up being sold for scrap, disassembled by 1941, the rail used for the war effort because we are now in World War II in the Pacific Theater. So there are a lot of mitigating circumstances that kind of did this. But yes, after my first hike and keeping the habit of going to flea markets and antique stores, oh, do you have anything with the Mount Low Railway on it? So, of course, postcards. So we've got probably three or 4,000 postcards that are basically all different. Uh, sterling silver souvenir spoons. Uh, in the 1880s, 1890s, people were collecting souvenir spoons. Many of our grandparents had them. Nobody knew what to do with them. And when I first got involved with collecting stuff, I joined the Spoon Club of Southern California. Who knew? <laughs> and uh, I was the youngest person in it. And uh, I asked, well, how many Mount Low spoons are there? Well, there may be 10 or 12 different ones. So I'd go to spoon shows and 
I found out now that I have 211 different souvenir spoons, and I still don't have all of them. So, I mean, there, there were tons of souvenirs. And at this point, our nonprofit foundation has collected over 800,000 images in our image collection from glass plate negatives to slides to transparencies to prints to cabinet photos. Uh, and we're over 20,000 three-dimensional small artifacts, too, which include everything from San Gabriel Valley Railroad, Pacific Electric Railway, Southern Pacific, and pretty much everything in the southwestern United States. So it kind of has grown exponentially, but if you really look for stuff, it's there. I'm really fascinated by Mr. Lowe. Sure. What, what role did he play? Did he develop the railroad? Did he develop the... Uh, buildings that were eventually built, or uh, what was his role, and what did exist, you know, at the top of the mountain or at the top at the end of the line, you might say. Sure. So Thaddeus Lowe, as I mentioned, retired here in 1888. It didn't take long till everybody knew by building a 24,000 square foot home that this is a man of means. Then it turned out that he was the man that built the seven balloons for the Union Army to spy on the Confederates. So even though he was the chief aeronaut of the Union Army, he was always a civilian. He was never uh, enlisted or in uniform, if you will. And all the failures that I mentioned before with illuminating gas and heating gas and ammonia gas and hydrogen gas, all those things kind of followed him out here. So he became involved in the community and in greater Los Angeles for providing cheaper gas to gas customers that needed uh, gas for heating and illuminating. He developed a couple of local electric companies. He had the Pasadena Ice Company, as I mentioned, for a time. So he really uh, was just a person that was used, if you will, voluntarily uh, to take advantage of his funds and complete this railway up into the local mountains. So Historians will note that in the 1890s, there was a nationwide recession. Thaddeus Lowe continued to pay his employees, and it eventually bankrupted him. So before he even had had this railway for a year, he was virtually bankrupt and penniless. When he finally died in January of 1913, his estate was worth less than $100. Uh, he had lost his home on Orange mm -hmm. Grove. He rented it back. He couldn't afford to pay the rent. Uh, he died on Euclid over here, where the Pasadena Convention Center is, in a rented home uh, that his daughter, in fact, the home over time was ended up uh, being owned by the Pashkian family, the rug merchants who have been around since then. Uh, so it, it's really kind of interesting that he was interested in seeing the Incline Railway built. As I mentioned, he came from Randolph, New Hampshire. So, of course, they had the Mount Washington Cog Railway there. So this was not an unknown thing to build an Incline Railway. This was different technology here than was used there. Uh, so he was very interested in getting the community up into the local mountains. John Muir was a very good friend of his, an overnight guest at his home. John Muir was a proponent of getting out into the local mountains, hiking, seeing nature, seeing wilderness. And because of that uh, relationship, Thaddeus Lowe was invited to become part of the Yosemite Commission, which, of course, uh, uh, started Yosemite National Park. So there are a lot of connections that Lowe had. He is who I like to call the most famous man you've never heard of. I've been working on a comprehensive biography, and uh, that's probably going to end up being the working title of the book. Like I mentioned, more than 200 patents, flying balloons. He was launching balloons off of barges on the Potomac during the Civil War. I mentioned this the other day. He created the first aircraft carrier. I mean, amazing technology. And, and there are some people that may dispute some of these things, but we have so many things in our archives and Matthew Brady photographs and... There, there is so much evidence of what he did. I would like, if there's anything else that I do in my life, is set the record straight on this man's work. Well, it can't be said that you're not passionate about it. <laughs> you obviously uh, are very passionate about um, uh, describing what he's done and what he's meant to this community. Uh, I'd like to take a, a moment and, and just describe the incline. So there is a, an incline railway in los angeles in downtown it's very short i think you still pay maybe 50 cents and, and it rides all year round and it takes you from i think third street to fourth street i don't know if you've if you've been there angels flight that's correct yes right. and i've been on another incline in in pittsburgh i think it's called the duquesne incline that's correct uh, so yeah. would this be similar um but you know from ground level up to where this hotel used to be is probably a gain of 1500 feet or so i mean it's quite a, a little distance. bit more than 1500 feet in elevation gain its average uh 
degree of ascent is 63%, so it was one of the steepest in the world. It was powered electrically, so when you get into Rubio Canyon, up Canyon, there were nine waterfalls that would generate electricity via a Pelton wheel, and that would run that electric incline railway. But what we found out over time, we talk about global warming now, we try to be cognizant of greenhouse gases and all these things. Our average rainfall when the railway opened in July of 1893 was 24 inches a year here. So you stop and think about 24 inches a year of average rainfall in the 1890s. Of course, there, I think we're at eight inches this rain season year, so it ebbs and flows. There were floods in 1914, there were floods in 1938, uh, there were a lot of other mitigating circumstances, but when they built this railway and they thought, oh great, we've got all these inches of rain per year, we're going to generate electricity, <laughs> well, it lasted about six months and then the water dried up, it went into the ground table underneath the San Gabriel Valley, and so they had to get gasoline engines to generate more electricity, to put in storage batteries to continue to run the incline. So it was something that was different in a lot of respects. So it was more steep than a lot of the places in the world. Uh, the elevation gain was more than 1,600 feet, as we just mentioned. And uh, it was something that uh, it was nearly 3,000 feet in length. So it was pretty amazing. They used an inch and a half cable that was over 3,000 feet in length because it had to connect the bottom car and the top car to one another. And as you mentioned, Angel's Flight in downtown Los Angeles, it's a funicular. So what that means to the rest of the world is that there are two cars, one's at the top and one's at the bottom, and the motor that supplies the electricity drives the cars past one another along this continuous loop cable and moves the top car to the bottom and vice versa. So it is a funicular just like there are other funiculars around. Angel's Flight Downtown is a perfect example of that. Are the cable cars in San Francisco the same? So they are not. So cable cars are run with cables that are buried in the ground. Okay, so they're actually traveling on steel plates that have a groove in the middle. So the, the concept is basically the same, but it is different. Uh, Pacific Electric Railway red cars, for example, that had overhead wire. So they are electric and they are driven, but different type of thing. So in essence, because the, the cable is under the funicular on the Mount Low Railway, it technically is considered similar to, but... People who are pure on history say, no, it is not a cable car because it's not buried in the ground. It's above ground. And that large, I'll call it a wheel or a cog that remains up there, is mm -hmm. that part of the side that the incline was? Yeah, so that is a grip wheel that's about nine and a half feet in diameter. It's got 72 teeth in it. They were made by Baker Ironworks in downtown Los Angeles. It's a continuous gripping hinge. So as the wheel turned, it pushed on the cable toward the grip, and it would pull that cable around and draw the cars up and down the hill. Uh, Baker Ironworks, as a matter of fact, in downtown Los Angeles, did virtually all the foundry and steel work for the Mount Low, Low Railway, and they were the ones who actually first brought suit uh, to Thaddeus Lowe for payment in 1894 mm -hmm. because of lack of payment and because this thing hadn't opened and, and hadn't been successful. And something else we need to think about as well is the average wage of these people in those days was not much more than a dollar a day. And to be a passenger on the Mount Low Incline Railway when it opened in 1893, it was $5 for a round trip. So it was enormously expensive. The people who built it could not afford to ride it themselves. How long did it take to build? They began in 1890, and they worked continuously through 1893. So there are a lot of things that kind of encompass how long did it take to build. So when they first began, they began at Lake and Calaveras, and there was a horse car that would take you from Lake and Calaveras to the northwest around Woodbury to go back up into Rubio Canyon. So you didn't go up Lake Street because there was no Lake Street at that time as we know it. So then once they got into the canyon, there was a hotel at Rubio canyon there with the nine waterfalls that was rubio pavilion once you got to the top of the incline railway there was echo mountain house which was 70 rooms that was opened after the chalet the chalet became the bunkhouse for all the workers the workers would stay there during the building season of course with all the rain we had 
In those days, in the cold that would happen as we experience overnight cold in the mountains, a lot of times there would be snow up there in those days. So they would work when they could. They stayed as long as they could and continued to build. And after they finished at Echo Mountain, had Thaddeus Lowe stopped there, he might have been okay financially, but he wanted to push on. He stopped another three miles beyond Echo Mountain, back to a place called Alpine Tavern. It was Crystal Springs. That's a natural source of spring water, which supplied not only that tavern, but the hotels below. He wanted to go to the actual peak of Oak Mountain or Mount Low, and he ran out of funds. So he stopped at Crystal Springs in 1894. Lawsuits began. He lost control of it by 1897. Uh, some of the interim people uh, that were owners include Jared Sidney Torrance, uh, founder of the city of Torrance. He was a resident of South Pasadena at that time. Uh, so there are a lot of things that continued. Thaddeus Lowe built the observatory there. So these were all kind of ongoing little projects. So the answer to the question, how long did it take to build? Basically, from 1890 to 1895, there was continued construction. And when the Pacific Electric built it, they standardized a lot of the track and the bridge work and, and infrastructure. So it was kind of an ongoing basis. They had floods in hotels that ruined them. There were fires uh, that ruined things. And over time, they were not replaced. It was all a disaster waiting to happen, though, wasn't it? Because of nature or weather conditions right sure so they say mother nature is one who will reclaim what she wants on her time and and she did indeed so yes uh in those days heating and illuminating were done by gas uh there was not a lot of fire protection or thought the structures were basically all wood and uh they were really victims of the elements, to be to be sure. And we see even in days uh, that are modern now, the station fire and some of the other things, uh, these things will be taken out in a moment's notice. This is in Victorian era, and in all the pictures that I've seen, the the clothing that everybody's wearing is just looks extremely uncomfortable. But I, I've I've heard, and maybe you can verify this, that they were the 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 guests of this hotel couldn't be troubled to to look at the behind of a donkey to carry their stuff up. So the donkey, instead of pulling them up, would actually push them up for that reason. Is that true? Okay, so that <laughs> is a little bit of a legend, a little bit of truth. Okay. So there is an area, once you get to the top of the incline and you've seen what there is there, and that's Echo Mountain, and you travel another three miles back on what they called the Alpine Division or the continuation of the Sam Merrill Trail, which is also now a fire road in modern times, once you got to Alpine Tavern, that was a place where they had miniature golf, they had more dancing, they had live bands, uh, they had pool tables. I hear during Prohibition that they had alcohol and slot machines. I've never seen photographic proof. I have copies of wine lists, uh, so I know there, there was alcohol there, so that's neither here there, nor there. But if you traveled another maybe quarter mile away from Alpine Tavern to the southeast, there was a place called Inspiration Point. So there is a hiking destination there to this day. There are what are called viewing tubes, pieces of pipe that are set in concrete that view like up to 30 different locations like South Pasadena, Alhambra, Catalina Island on a clear day, things of that nature. So there was a man that retired after uh, World War I he had tuberculosis. He came to the Alpine Tavern and stayed there, but he figured out quite quickly that he couldn't stay in a tavern and have room service and a residence there on his pension. So he went out and he built a cabin out near Inspiration Point. This man, uh, whose name was Tobin, he had a mule and he would make scenic rides. So at Inspiration Point, there's a place called Easter Rock where they did uh, sunrise Easter services there. And about another three quarters of a mile to a mile to the east along the top ridge of the mountain heading toward the Mount Wilson area, uh, he had a mule named Herbert. And Herbert the mule would push the cart out to uh, Morning Glory Point, which is the top of Eaton Canyon to give everybody a view of the south and the east. So Herbert the Mule ate slop from Alpine Tavern. And nobody wants to be behind a mule that's been eating slop. So, and this was told to me firsthand by a man named Joe Tobin. Joe has passed away. His widow is now, I think, just celebrated her 94th or 95th birthday. And Joe came in and was interviewed by me in my home many years ago. And he told the true story of Herbert the Mule, his father, how he came to build the railway and why the mule pushed the cart. It's not that they couldn't stand looking <laughs> at him. They just didn't want to be behind him. This is amazing. This is better than Google, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, right. What, a, what a treat for the audience who 
are familiar with this area, who have been up there, and to to learn all this history is quite amazing, right? It, it is. It's quite remarkable. And, um, you know, I'm just wondering. So it started in the 1890s, and the last uh, building stood until 36. Correct. Is that right? Yes. And it bankrupted low. Yes. And at the time it was finished, it was so expensive that the average person couldn't even afford to take the railroad Correct. Uh, railway. Was this ever successful or was it just this oddity that existed for a period of time and disappeared? I think it depends upon how you measure success. So if it's by ridership, certainly. Uh, was it accessible to everybody? No. Uh, my own grandparents who grew up in the area, like I mentioned, they went once in 1933. The three kids and my great-grandmother had to split one sandwich and one Coke. And I asked, did you take any pictures? Well, Michael, we weren't wealthy. We couldn't afford a camera or film. We could barely afford the ticket up there. What was the attraction uh, for, for them, for example? For and, them, and I think... Go ahead. I'm sorry. And I was going to say, didn't they uh, come from the coast uh, you know, Long in Beach. other words, they were in Long yes. Beach. Okay. So what was the attraction to go to Pasadena? Was it just to go up the mountain and get the view? And I think it was something that everybody had talked about. They had seen it in the newspapers. There were some silent films that were filmed up in that area. Uh, Clara Bow uh, kept a cheetah there. Mm -hmm. They had a fox farm called Slicer Fox Farm, and they grew fox at that altitude because their pelts and coats would be thicker. I'm not condoning or saying anybody should own or wear any fur but this is what was done in the late 20s or early 30s so this was an adjunct of what existed there and uh, i think it was just because everybody had built there my great grandfather was a set builder uh, at mgm studios in culver city and he would take the red car from long beach to culver city to work on the sets he worked on gone with the wind and, and some of those major features as a set builder and uh, he would be gone for you know, extremely long days. And over time, he'd just encourage his wife and the, the kids to, to go do something fun. So they did go to the ostrich farm in South Pasadena. They went to the alligator farm at Lincoln Park. There were pigeon farms, uh, all sorts of amazing attractions. And uh, Mount Lowe was certainly on the top of the list, but they had to do a little bit of saving over the time to, to be able to afford it. But I will say that once it became part of Henry Huntington's Pacific Electric Railway red cars, the fare dropped enormously down to $1.25 a person. But that was still a lot of money in those days. If you're considering getting a Coke for a nickel and a loaf of bread for maybe eight, nine, ten cents, that's still a lot of money, particularly if you're going to have an adult and three children. Was that a direct connection to the red car? Yes, absolutely. So th they could get on the red car in Long Beach and without getting off of a train. Well, they, uh, they had to, to change, change trains. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and those, those were actually electric trolleys at that point. So they went from Long Beach to 6th and Main. They changed cars, went on the Pasadena short line from 6th and Main to Pasadena. And then they hopped on a third train to get up into Rubio Canyon. And how long would that take? From Long Beach to the top of the From Long mountain. Beach to the top of the incline, close to about three hours. So it was an all-day gig for sure. Right. Well, that's, that's yeah, quite a, quite a journey to travel for three hours. Um, the stories that you have are, are, are amazing, and I imagine that you have another story with uh, this item that you brought. Can you share that with us? Sure. So I do have this item that I've brought with me. Uh, this is a piece that's rather interesting. It is a piece of the Confederate balloon, Gazelle, that was built by the Confederates as a response to the Union Army having their seven balloons. So this particular piece was recently donated by Jay Haig. He lives in Ponte Vedra, Florida. And he is a three times great grandson of Thaddeus Lowe. He has been a longtime friend of ours, as have his siblings. His mother is like a second mom to me, Hope Wilson Haig, and her late husband, John Roland Haig, uh, was the two times great grandson. Uh, Hope and John came to Southern California not long after I started hiking in the mountains, and they said that they wanted to find the Mount Low guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was put in touch with them, and uh, it turned out that we had a ton of things in common. So when we first started talking, we met in Long Beach. Uh, they were staying in Altadena to visit some friends. And uh, 
we went to a favorite restaurant down there, which will name remain nameless because I don't <laughs> want points off for my SGV three later. <laughs> and uh, we ended up talking about sailing, and we had the same sailboats that were like. 18 serial numbers apart, uh, which was amazing. And we were just immediate family. And she kept talking about all the things that they had in the attic at their home in South Freeport and what they had on Bailey Island. And the home on Bailey Island had been in their family since the 1890s. So it, it was pretty amazing. And so she said, oh, you'll have to come back sometime and look at some of this stuff in the attic. And I said, well, anytime you need any help cleaning out that attic, you let me know. And without missing a beat, God bless her, I adore this woman. She grabbed my wrist and she said, what month do you have available? And she said, and I'm not being facetious, if you come, you're not coming for a week or 10 days. You're gonna stay for a month. We're gonna to get to know you. We're gonna to get to know what you know. We'll take you and meet you or introduce you to other families and have you meet them that are all cousins. And this was kind of the uh, cementing factor for the reunion we did in Philadelphia for the Lowe family back in 2000, where we had in excess of 100 family members all directly related to Thaddeus Lowe. Virtually nobody had met one another before. So this piece had been in that branch of the family until recently, and Hope is now in assisted living. Uh, John has passed mm -hmm. away many years ago, and the three times great grandson, Jay, said, you know what, we've got this piece, you know, would you like to have it for your museum? So, yes. So the, the rumor is that the ladies of the Confederacy donated their silk dresses because they had no raw materials. The ports were frozen because of the war. They're blockaded. And uh, that's not exactly true, but there were bolts of silk. Uh, there was this one balloon made. It had an accident virtually immediately. It got caught on a sandbar, and the Union Army surrounded that uh, group or that contingent of Confederates and basically took control of the balloon. They cut up the envelope. They gave everybody in Congress at that time a piece of this balloon, and they split it up amongst the low descendants as well, and that's where the origin of this piece comes from. Wow, that's uh, yeah, another great story to share with our listeners. Uh, I want to get more into the the museum that you're you're working on, and uh, but before we do that, let's take a quick break, and we'll be right back. The legal process can be intimidating. You don't know where to start, and you're unsure of what to expect. The attorneys and staff at the law offices of Scott Warmoth have been serving the San Gabriel Valley for over 35 years, helping people just like you navigate through the legal process and ensuring you're treated fairly. You can find them at law888.com or call 626-282-6868. That's 626-282-6868. All right, we're back with Michael. Uh, before the break, you were you had mentioned the, this museum that you're working on in Pasadena, and you know this obviously is an amazing piece to have in there. But why don't you share with the listeners a little bit more about that? Sure. So, within the realm of of collecting and and trying to preserve history, it makes really no sense to have these things if they're not shareable, viewable, and used as educational tools for anybody who needs to have or wants to have access to them. When I first started getting involved in these things, there are a lot of places where you can go and you know that these things exist and you want to see them. You make an appointment to try to see them and for circumstances beyond our control, we can't do that. Uh, it, it's something that for me and my wife, uh, not having any children, we wanted to provide some sort of uh, benefit to the San Gabriel Valley and, and the greater population, really, with the internet now globally, of, of having these things made available. So in 2000, when we began the foundation, the Mount Low Preservation Society, our goal was to have a nonprofit educational foundation, not charge admission, be able to have these artifacts and pieces of ephemera on display. And over time, people have come to embrace what we're doing. So in 2011, we purchased a building in Lamanda Park, East Pasadena, off of San Gabriel Boulevard and Foothill Boulevard. Uh, it's nearly a third of an acre. 14,000 square feet where we have built out an indoor railroad signal garden. Uh, we have over 800,000 images that I mentioned earlier, over 20,000 three-dimensional artifacts. One of the great things that we have is Thaddeus Lowe Jr.'s 1920 Cadillac. Uh, he purchased that new at Don Lee Cadillac in downtown Los Angeles. It's a one-off Harley Earl 
uh, car with a custom California top. It was featured in the Wall Street Journal and A.J. Bames column, My Ride, back in March of 2019. So we have some really amazing things. And our goal is that over time, people will see that we are going to be benefiting the community at large. So we're trying to figure out a way to put in ADA compliant bathrooms, put in an elevator and uh, build out the infrastructure so it's user friendly. And up until now, when we've gotten to the point where we're starting to make moves in that direction, we've had the benefit of the Pasadena Museum of History. So every few years we've done displays for them. We've typically taken the South Gallery, we put things on display for six months. They get between 2,500 and 3,000 people there. I've guest lectured there as well. So it's something that I feel really compelled to do for this community in which I live and work, and also to provide, as I mentioned, through the biography that I've been working on, is to let people know about who this man was. There are so many people, as you do with your podcast, that have great stories in the community. There are other great stories that have been ignored for years, that being a historian, I'm compelled to say, hey, everybody, look at this. Here's a guy with more than 200 patents. He actually, in advance of flying for the balloon corps and building balloons, had built the world's largest balloon, the balloon envelope, the canvas and silk part of it were more than 200 feet tall, held more than a, a million cubic feet of gas. He built and flew this balloon. He was gonna fly it across the Atlantic Ocean. And you say, Michael, there's no way that this man in 1856, 57, 58 would be able to do this. This was more than 100 years before this was done, and indeed it was done in 1964. However, Lowe had a suspicion, and mind you, this man had no more than a fourth grade education. He was one of four children born in Randolph, New Hampshire, as I mentioned before, 1832. His mother died when he was about nine years old. His father remarried. There were seven half-siblings, and Thaddeus Lowe ran away from home at basically 10 years of age. He had no formal education. He had an amazing work ethic. He was a brilliant guy, and he would look at the clouds, and he would say at some level, the clouds are always going from west to east. There has to be some sort of stream of air that goes that way. So it wasn't until the late 1930s, and there's argument as to who might have discovered the jet stream as we know it first. Some people say people in Japan, it, it could be anywhere, and I won't get into that aspect. But Thaddeus Lowe in 1855, 6, and 7 was saying that that was existing. He proved it. When he first started flying balloons, Joseph Henry, who was the head of the Smithsonian, said, if you want to take your balloon to Ohio and wait till the wind is blowing from east to west and get it up to a certain altitude and make it do a U-turn, he said, we'll see if we can get the Smithsonian to help you in this endeavor. He says, don't just take off over the Atlantic and, and not know where you're going to end up. And so Thaddeus Lowe did this. He flew from Cincinnati, Ohio. He held an airspeed record, an air duration record. Uh, he ended up in Union, South Carolina. He flew over 900 miles in nine hours. So that air flight record existed for years. Um, and, and he was in a wicker basket? He was in a wicker basket, And you've yes. got a few wicker baskets we in do. your collection. Yes, we do. Yes. And, and so how many people uh, could stand in a wicker basket? Well, modern days today, if you go ballooning down in Temecula or any of the places where you go as a tourist, they have 12, 14, 18 people uh, balloon capacity in, in, in those baskets. In those days, uh, it was basically a one or a two man basket. However, he had built a, di a 10 foot diameter basket with canvas over the top of it that looks exactly like a Gemini space capsule. He called it his life capsule. And this was a flyable balloon that we've got artifacts from this. We have canvas from it. Uh, the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian has the load ring from that. So this was a 10 foot diameter basket that had a small boat underneath it. So he knew that he was flying over water. He'd have to put down in the water at some point. Uh, but uh, yeah, he, he was going to bring three or four people with him at that time, which would have been the largest crew ever carried in a balloon. So it was amazing technology that he... Uh, he this guy is beyond belief. Yeah, yeah, he really is the, you know, I, I forgot the, the working title, but I think it's something like the most famous person you've never heard of. Exactly. That's... Uh, and he's become your passion, it seems. He has indeed. I mean, he, every time you open the refrigerator door, artificial refrigeration was one of his failures in the 1860s when he was trying to inflate balloons. He kept making this ice. Oh, well, okay, that's not necessarily a failure, but it is if you're trying to inflate a balloon. That's not going to help your balloon, mm -hmm. but it's going to help mankind. Wow. So why not? Yeah, I mean, just, just in this conversation alone, I, I feel 
a better connection to where I live and where I've grown up. You know, like anybody who's traveled down even the 10 freeway and certainly the 210 and you, you look north and you can see the San Gabriel Mountains. If you've never hiked up there, if you, you certainly know where Mount Wilson is. But to get a deeper understanding of how this area was built and settled and the people you know, that are responsible for so much is, is really just the, the, the thinkers or the, you know, it's just the, this type of pioneer sure. that built, um, you know, this community in Southern California. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, just great people. The, uh, you know, I, I really wish that we could go on and, and unfortunately the, the show is, is limited by time, but uh, if you are this excited to discuss these things, I'm really excited to, to hear how you describe uh, your favorite things in the San Gabriel Valley. So Michael, we call it the SGV3 and I know it's very difficult to limit yourself to three places or things or events, but w- what are your favorites in the San Gabriel Valley? San Gabriel Valley has such a wide variety of things to offer in virtually every aspect of our lives. So I would have to say first and foremost, the San Gabriel Mountains and the Mount Low Railway. That's kind of a given. Uh, The second thing for me uh, was formerly the Ranchero Mexican restaurant owned by the Mejia family. We used to eat all there all the time and we've been longtime friends of theirs and they were next door to our building but since they're gone it's lee's hoagie house on colorado boulevard Mm -hmm. and uh, roosevelt in pasadena that's my culinary place to go and the third place is the pasadena museum of history they have a lot of great displays they have the fenius mansion they have a lot of things that they rotate in and out and of course because we've been a part of that for so many years they're kind of a second family to us so those are my sgv3 yeah well those are great yeah i well i'm very familiar with lee's hoagie house and uh sahan who who owns that place and he he remembers everybody by name like you walk in there and he'll he'll greet you by first name wonderful place Uh, what do you like to get there so i have the grilled ahi tuna on a bed of roasted vegetables and uh, that's my go-to monday through friday and i was there again today (laughs) oh good and the fenya's mansion i i've been there with my wife uh wonderful place you never even know it exists Uh, i and i I don't where is it or what is it exactly so if you know where the avery campus used to be Mm -hmm. just north of the 210 freeway so there's a little parcel of land that if you continue past avery on the east side of orange grove down to the first street which is walnut if you turn right or east on walnut the first driveway that you can go into is the pasadena museum of history oh right yes okay I've walked past there many sure. times. Well, next time but you never need to been walk in. 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 Yes, right. <laughs> okay. The, you know, you can you can have a tour, and they, they bring you through most of the house, and some, it's a guided tour. And uh, I forget what room it is. Uh, it's, a, it's a large room, and there's art on the, on the walls, and I think there's a piano or something, but just incredible, incredible place. Yeah. The culture and history here is just, just like, it's so... Um, exciting and you know i moved to pasadena 27 years ago and i and i thought you know this is one place i can really be proud of living here you know sure it's just amazing all of the cultural icons that are here the institutions and so on Are, are you still doing displays for the the museum So the short answer is, if we get our gallery space and our ADA-compliant bathrooms done fairly soon, we would like to begin doing displays in our own museum. But save any complications with getting things built out or funding, uh, yes, I'm sure we will have an ongoing open invitation to go back and do things there. And where where do you see that in, uh, in the future? That's really a kind of a hard thing to gauge. So I think people have figured out after meeting me, knowing me, listening to my lectures, and I've given over 1,500 lectures in the past 21 years officially since the Nonprofit Foundation, I've never asked for anybody to help out to try to do the completion of my vision. But now we're to the point where we're in a 14,000 square foot building and we have to do fire sprinklers, which is going to be a quarter of a million dollars. We're going to have to do ADA compliant bathrooms. We're going to have to do an elevator. Uh, This is something that's going to be beyond my means. So I think that uh, through podcasts like yours and maybe getting the word out further, that maybe we'll find some people that like to have a gallery space named after them perhaps and uh, get them to become benefactors or donors and help us kind of push the 
this through the end and, and get this opened up. So hopefully, in the answer to your question, it will be a very short term. <laughs> Well, I, I've been there and Scott has been there and you have uh, some amazing artifacts and pieces there that uh, that alone is interesting. But I think the real uh, gem is is you actually, oh, you know, thank you. and all the, the passion and knowledge that you have to share is 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 really incredible. I mean, I I love to see and recognize passion in people and, and it's absolutely there with you. There's there's no mistaking that. Thank you. Uh, Michael, if someone wants to get a hold of you or reach out to you uh, or connect with you, how can they do that? Uh, our website is mountlow.org, M-O-U-N-T-L-O-W-E, and our publishing company, goldenwestbooks.com. Uh, we're uh, in East Pasadena, so you can get a hold of us through either of those websites. There are phone numbers attached. Our office number is area code 626 Four five eight eight one four eight. Leave a message, and uh, if you have anything that uh, you would like to donate, artifacts, ephemera, photographs, uh, anything that you would like to do or see done with our community, or would like to help us financially, we'd be absolutely thrilled to hear from you. Yeah, I'd really like to encourage people to participate because it is a treasure that you have, and what you've collected, and over the years, you've just got so many beautiful things. You've got. Uh, several books that you've published and these books are very informative and historical and they can all be purchased through your publishing company yes absolutely goldenwestbooks.com and because we're a small business owner we like to uh, promote other small businesses so our books are all also available at romans which is a great go-to place for all us lucky enough to be in the area pasadena museum of history gift store sells them huntington library gift store sells them so yeah we're we're well known and available so if you can't find us you're not looking hard enough (laughs) (laughs) i've seen four of your books how many have you published so that's a trick question so i have authored or co-authored five books but i've published numerous beginning with golden west books in 1960 when donald duke started our company has published over 160 books since his passing in 2010 we've published about five or six books we try to do one every year and then i try to do one for other publishers every year as well and we're hoping to ramp that up a little bit once we get the building a little more situated i'll have a little bit more freedom to put some of my thoughts and and uh, words into print wow well, thank you, Michael, for sharing that uh, with us and our listeners. And thank you for spending this time with us. And I hope that you guys, uh, the listener, got something out of this because that was quite a remarkable story and, and a real connection to the history of this area. And uh, I'm assuming that if you if you are listening to this podcast, that you do have a connection to this uh, San Gabriel Valley. So uh, I encourage you also to to reach out to Michael and, uh, and support his cause. So, yeah, yeah, I, I just think that you know, we just touched upon like a whole universe of things that, that uh, Michael brings to the table. And, and yes, for all of our listeners, this would be a very valuable resource to connect with and help in whatever way that, that uh, you can do. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Michael. Appreciate thank you, it. Russell. And thank you, Scott. Both. Thanks for checking out another episode of the SGV Master Key. You can find the full back catalog of the SGV Master Key at sgvmasterkey.com and wherever you get your podcasts. This show was produced and edited by Russell Mono and Victoria Allers of Kind Monster Productions. Thanks again for listening or watching. We'll see you again real soon in the next episode. Nice matter. No, kind of matter.